Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brad Bell, the William J. Kennedy Professor of Strategic Human Resources here in the ILR School at Cornell. I also serve as the Academic Director of our Center for Advanced Human Resource Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our seventh and final CARS webcast of 2023. I'm joined today by two students from our Master's in Industrial and Labor Relations Program, Allison Bruce and Joyce Garosby. Allison and Joyce have been serving as research assistants for CARS this semester, working on the project that they'll be presenting today on the cultural implications of flexible work models. Over the past few years, we've witnessed a tremendous change in where and when work gets done. As one example, immediately prior to the pandemic, employees spent on average about 5% of their time working from home. Today, that figure sits at 30%. Experts have calculated that overnight, we saw growth in flexible work that was a, equivalent to about 40 years of pre-pandemic growth. So clearly the change has been very dramatic and sudden. It's also clear that this growth in flexible work is not a passing fad. Today, hybrid work arrangements have surpassed both fully in-person and fully remote work as a dominant model among those who are able to work from home. The bottom line is clear, flexible work is here to stay. As companies work to adapt to this new reality, one question is commonly raised is how this shift will impact company culture. Will employees lose their connection to the company and to one another, thereby degrading company culture? Or will the expansion of flexible work help to enhance the employee value proposition through greater personalization and greater work-life balance? The project that Allison and Joyce will we'll be presenting today was really aimed at answering these critical questions. Before I turn it over to them, I'd like to take a minute to briefly introduce each of them and then give you a quick idea of what we plan to do over the next 45 minutes or so. So Allison is a second year Mylar from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Prior to joining the Mylar program, she worked for four and a half years at Amazon, most recently working as an HRBP supporting fulfillment operations in Dallas, Texas. After graduating in May, she will be joining Dell, one of our CARS partner companies, as a program manager working on their talent management team. Joyce is a second year Mylar, originally from the Canadian Rockies in Calgary, Alberta. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Calgary in international relations and business. She worked in the nonprofit world in DC and spent over four years in Asia, specifically Shanghai and Sing Singapore in market consulting and startups. She interned at Cummins over the summer and will be moving to Southern California after she graduates here in December and will be exploring her future options. So with that, I just want to give you a little bit idea of our plan for the, the session. So Allison and Joyce will start off by spending the first 30 to 35 minutes or so sharing information about their research, uh, key findings that emerged, and their implications. We'll reserve the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session to answer any questions that you may have. So I encourage you to please submit your questions at any point throughout the presentation. I'll be uh, accumulating them and then we'll take them either as we go along or in the Q&A session at the end. You can submit your questions uh, to us using the Q&A function here in Zoom or you can just simply put them into the chat. I would also encourage you to share your own insights and reactions with other participants through the chat function throughout today's presentation. How do the research findings that Allison and Joyce are sharing compare to what you're seeing in your own organization? And what additional insights or perspectives can you offer on the topics we'll be talking about? So with that background, I'd like to turn it over to our RAs. Thank you, Brad. Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to sharing our findings around the cultural implications of these flexible working models. In terms of our agenda, we'll go over briefly our study, talk a bit about the company personas and flexibility at those companies, as well as review the cultural impacts that these models have had to them. We'll dive in a little bit to the manager's role in HR practices and how these models have shifted there. And then we'll finish by concluding with the future implications and open it up for Q&A. As Brad mentioned, my name is Allison. I'm one of the CARS RAs for this semester. Hi, everyone, and I'm Joyce Grosby. All right, so we want to start with a 30,000-foot view of our research objectives for some context. 
So as indicated on the title, and as Brad mentioned, our goal is to really try and understand the what and how of flex work models and their impact on culture. And these are the three areas that we focused on. So first we wanted to capture what current flexible models look like. So we asked questions like, you know, how are they being adopted? What are the challenges and how is the workforce responding? And further, what are the spillover effects on culture, especially in areas like engagement and productivity? Secondly, we wanted to magnify any changes to the manager's role as a result of these flex models. So we wanted to know if expectations for managerial skills have changed drastically. And further, we wanted to understand how managers are navigating this new and uncertain territory of driving culture and performance uh, in this new environment. And then thirdly, we dove into HR practices, where we wanted to analyze to what extent HR practices have adapted changing work models. And we delved into areas like talent development to performance management. And our goal here was really to try to gain insights into how HR and businesses as a whole are evolving to meet the demands of a flexible workforce. So to do this, we interviewed 21 leaders across 18 companies who led in areas related to employee experience, talent strategy, or were involved in flexible work policies to some capacity. And so we also analyzed quality qualitative data from our nine interview questions, as well as quantitative data from our Qualtrics survey. And so I just wanna take this time to say that Allison and I had many insightful conversations the past few months with our CARS members. And we just wanna extend a big, big thank you again to the participating companies for being super generous with your time and for your engagement. And we generally hope that you get something out of the insights and analysis that we prepared today. So introducing our first area of focus, uh, the overview of flex work models. So right off the bat, we realized that some companies, which is around 25%, uh, had already adopted some sort of flex model prior to the pandemic. And through our survey, we found that 95% of overall companies adopted location-based and schedule-based flexibility, which included practices like removing core hours or not having a mandated specific days in office. And 53% had some form of compressed work week policy. So an example, fitting five days into four or 4.5 days. And 11% had indicated other. And we'll look at these outlier cases uh, later in a slide. So overall, the data did show that companies embrace flexible work models to varying degrees, with over half of respondents reporting that 90% of their employees were utilizing some sort of flex work. And I just want to emphasize here that Specifically, we were looking at knowledge, the knowledge workforce, and we did have some companies note that they're exploring flex work models for their frontline workers, but this area is still very much in its nascent stages. And then the last note on this slide, um, so the specific distribution of these arrangements really varied across departments, roles, and geographical locations within the company. And there was not like one size fits all approach that any company took, um, and Allison will talk about that later. All right, now looking at the company personas, here we really want to depict these as distinct, not as distinct categories that companies fell under, but rather we want to visualize it, um, as you'll see here, as a spectrum where companies evolved over time and are influenced by forces like external factors. So thinking about events like the proliferation of tech or a global pandemic and internal factors like a reorg design or the implementation of a new business strategy. So these are all really different forces that influence a company's policy and adoption of these flex work models. And as you can see from our beautifully drawn bell curve by Allison, hybrid was really the most common model with a minimum of two to three days in the office, where in most cases, um, companies grounded it based on roles and where employees were given a primary location. And then there were a few companies on one tail end that instituted a full return to office or four days a week on site. And the other side of the extreme end were full on flexible and had no minimum days expected per week. Now I'll pass it back to Allison, who will discuss decisions and exceptions to these policies. Thanks, Joyce. Most companies that we spoke with had a policy with some room for exceptions. These exceptions were mainly grounded in the role being classified as either remote, hybrid, or in office. Most exceptions seem to be approved by the manager with some level of partnership with HR. However, some companies did indicate a greater, more formal approval process, depending on the type of exception with various levels of approval. We asked our participants what type of exceptions they considered, and these were our responses. 
most commonly medical, followed by caregiving and then family relocation. We did have 53% of the companies state that they would consider a reason that was not listed here. Specifically, the reasons were that some companies didn't see review the reason for request at all. Some companies looked at the distance from office. Some companies would review requests, whether they were temporary or permanent, that followed a different path. It all just depended on a variety of factors. Additionally, as Joyce mentioned, we did have some exception cases and some outliers. So specific outliers were measuring quarterly or biweekly as opposed to weekly. Most companies had some minimum per week, as Joyce mentioned, but these companies would understood that maybe weeks to week there were different demands. And so they would ask for potentially 50% over the course of the time period as opposed to time during the specific week. For roles that were traditionally on-site roles, some companies started applying the flex models to these. So specifically, we saw job sharing or compressed work weeks here. Um, so the compressed work weeks would be either four 10-hour days or a 980 schedule, which would be uh, every two weeks, people would work nine days, nine hours, 80 hours for the entire time, giving them that 10th day off. Additionally, work anywhere policies were a theme as well. So these are policies that allow employees to work anywhere. They're geographically and legally eligible to do so um, for up to 30 days in a given year. And lastly, we had some companies that grounded their approval process, not by the role, but just based on the individual, recognizing that everybody is different and there is no one size fits all. We did have a couple of employee persona categories. So we thought this was interesting as it came up in almost every interview to some extent. So we have grouped these by developmental benefits of returning and then also employees that have challenges or preferences with returning. So first under developmental benefits and returning, we had new hires and people that were early in career that often benefit from the informal conversations, maybe that they're overhearing their peers have, or maybe they're able to ask peers questions after a meeting that would be a little bit more challenging to do if you were working fully remote. Additionally, these benefit also from social capital gains as well of working alongside their peers. Moving into employees with longer tenure, they're often the ones able to provide those developmental benefits to those first two groups or potentially the social capital. Next, as we turn to the challenges and personal preferences in returning, we do have generational differences as indicated by both our interviews and our external research. External research did say, however, that 64% of all generations employees of all generations would consider leaving if they were forced to return to the office full-time, indicating that flexibility is a major priority of all generations. Next, we had flexible natives. So these were employees that started when work was fully remote, whether that be start with the company or started their career. And maybe they were able to be successful in these old work models. And now these new work models have them questioning why they need to return if they were previously successful. And last but not least, caregivers. We all know that caregivers were faced at the start of the pandemic with challenges adjusting their caregiving responsibilities. And ultimately, now we're asking for them to readjust as we return to the office, presenting them with potentially unique challenges of how to apply these flex models to balance that with their life. And with that, we'll turn over to Joyce to talk through the cultural implications. Thanks, Allison. So we had some interesting results from the quantitative data where we asked two questions. So the first one was on the perception of overall impact of flex work on company culture represented here by the X axis and where one cult, where one culture had been extremely negatively impacted to five culture has been extremely positively impacted. And the second question was on to what extent leaders believe flexible work had impacted their company culture represented here on the Y axis. So one being not impacted at all to five at the top being extremely impacted. And as we can see from the results, our entire sample size of companies mostly stayed on the top right quartile, indicating that generally flexible work models have had a significant impact on their culture and that the impact has been generally positive. But as you can see with the companies hovering in the middle, uh, there was still a significant portion around 40% of cars companies who feel that flex work has had a mixed impact on the culture. So this is kind of interesting as we talk to these leaders because most did highlight the benefits, but as we can see in the survey, the perception is actually more mixed. So zooming into the challenges and benefits of flex work models, 
uh, generally we found that most companies reported significant gains in areas like employee retention, improved employee work-life balance, and increased employee satisfaction. And uh, they specifically highlighted, highlighted that um, customization for individual needs as a key benefit. And overall companies reported that this all contributed to uh, a growing employee value proposition. However, these models were not without their challenges. And companies reported really struggling with managing expectations and entitlements outside of medical exemptions. However, however, we did find that um, companies had their policies grounded in specific roles. Uh, those are the companies that had an, a much easier time managing these requests. Uh, the second point on, on, the, on the challenges is that companies also indicated that collaboration and team integration proved to be difficult, especially in hybrid settings. And as a consequence, uh, change management and maintaining accountability for employees to come into the office also pose significant hurdles. Lastly, we wanted to highlight the type of data that was being collected and the tools used. So tools like Pulse and engagement surveys were standard and were ubiquitous across the companies, with some companies using a more targeted approach with quarterly hybrid experience surveys and using things like the manager impact index to measure effectiveness of leaders. Some companies did track um, a sense of connection as well for post in-person and uh, virtual events. And an interesting tool that did come up was the use of the organizational network analysis to help understand the shifts and changes in communication and collaboration patterns and to understand how decisions are made and how information flows within an organization. Um, and then the one thing I want to point out is that some companies did report to explore to exploring monitor batch lives and some IP tracking. But again, the ultimate goal was to understand usage patterns of office spaces and for legal tax compliance purposes. So in a nutshell, engagement scores were generally up and companies are still trying to figure out how to measure productivity in a knowledge work setting and tracking this area uh, remains a complicated endeavor. Now pivoting into the manager's role and the shifting expectations as a result of these flex work models. So generally these flex work models um, haven't really drastically changed expectations of manager skills, but rather we found that it's amplified the need for these foundational manager skills. So parsing out the responses, we identified these four key themes. So number one at the top, soft skills, two on the right, talent management development, bottom agility, change management, and then four to the left is engagement, belonging, and connection. So for soft skills, uh, interview responses showed that managers need skills and empathy. So that might mean, you know, being acutely aware of the diversity and personalities um, and working styles within a team. And managers also need to be cognizant of the mental health makeup of their team and exhibit self-awareness, especially the ability to read through, you know, virtual and in-person interactions. And lastly, managers need to ensure equity across teams. On the talent management side, managers are expected to know, you know when to exercise their coaching muscles beyond supervision and managing processes. They also need to know how to exercise good judgment and conduct hard conversations. And they're also expected to lead by example. So as a story, uh, we did hear one company who adopted this approach. Um, and you know, if, if that, their team is in office and not eligible to work remote or hybrid, the same po policy would automatically apply to the manager. So the third area is on agility and change management. Uh, companies here echoed concerns of the challenges leading distributed teams, not only by their modes, so for teams in home hybrid hub settings, but also across different time zones. Uh, managers need to be able to adapt and be agile in their approaches to leading these teams and recognize that each setting will really demand you know, different tools and skills to flex. And as a result, managers are expected to be constantly learning while also empowering their teams to learn and adapt in order to navigate these gray areas more effectively. And the fourth and final area is a manager's role in fostering uh, engagement, belonging, and connection, and making sure that you know, we're applying DEI initiatives. So a manager needs to be able to be inclusive and bring people together and be able to maximize the time spent in office by making it meaningful. And so that might mean making a concerted effort to schedule days in office for teams and um, creating intentional connections 
to you know, construct a more inclusive environment across distributed teams and different geographic and generational boundaries. I'll pass it on to Allison now to highlight what this means for HR practices. Thank you, Joyce. So first, as we look at HR practices, we want to dig into talent management and performance management, a practice that spans the manager and HR. So first theme that we heard from our companies here is that people, leaders need to be true leaders and not just process experts. Some companies did note that they were reevaluating talent pipelines to give employees a path to promotion that doesn't force them into management roles that they might be uninterested in or potentially not ready for yet. Additionally, manager playbooks and guides have been given to managers to help them more clearly navigate gray areas. And lastly, we'll talk more about accountability in a bit, but part of that is incorporating the how of performance reviews into how they're coming into the office or how frequently they're coming into the office. Moving into the benefits and rewards. So as we've talked, child care or caregiving in general has been an opportunity for some of these populations. So some organizations have offered child care and elder care resources to support these individuals, as well as reimbursements have been another theme to give people a similar experience, whether they're working from home or in office, and more importantly, helping with the ergonomics related concerns that to decrease potential injuries. Moving into compliance, so with the Work Anywhere policy, some companies did note a ear towards the legality implications of that that could potentially be coming down the pipe from the legislation perspective. And additionally, a perceived fairness on the policy application, as Joyce mentioned, um, but as we said, the companies that did have a policy grounded in the role seem to have a little bit easier of a time navigating that. Moving into engagement and inclusion, so bringing people together for those moments that matter is really important, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. Also leaning in and in some cases revamping the affinity groups and mentorship programs to ensure that they're beneficial for all employees regardless of work and work location, and then planning regular in-person events and thinking beyond what is normal and thinking what employees truly want and what they'll value out of those experiences. So digging into engagement, belonging, and connection, this slide highlights suggestions from our companies, but also through our research that themes that we identified. One theme that we did notice is that this seems to be a responsibility of managers more than ever before. Specifically, organizations should be empowering managers to start now and not wait for the organization to roll out a program or a guidebook or anything, and instead let managers do what they think their employees would value. One really simple solution is for employees to update their work location on whatever instant messaging system your company utilizes so that their peers know that day whether or not you can find them in office or maybe you need to give them a call if you need something. One suggestion we really liked was the idea of hosting inclusive meetings. So hosting meetings to be either all in person or all remote so that there's no disparate um, impact of people that are maybe missing out on conversations that happen before a meeting starts or after a meeting ends. Additionally, this helps with the informal chatting time before the meeting to minimize that so that no employees feel that they're missing out on a connection just because they don't work in that location. However, if you do have a remote meeting, you could schedule time at the beginning of the meeting to give people time to chat about non-work related things and just catch up on their life events prior to the meeting starting. Moving into similar non-work related chats, you could also create non-work related chats in the instant messaging system for specific topics or hobbies that people might be interested in where they can find common ground among their peers. Potentially this is regarding sports or pets or maybe their foodies, whatever the thing is that your employees care about, just creating a way for them to collaborate and discuss that to create bonds. Moving into performance management, so as we mentioned, accountability was a theme that we heard from companies. Some companies find it challenging to enforce these flexible work models and ensure that people are coming into the office for those collaboration and moments that matter that we'll talk about. So one way that they're doing that is incorporating in-office time into the how of the performance review, specifically noting that this is how they contribute to the company's culture. Another way some companies are doing it is through self-accountability, giving employees an automated email or otherwise that tells them how often they're coming into the office so they're able to monitor themselves. 
This then reinforces our next theme of trust and accountability. So pre-pandemic, potentially managers could walk around an office and see who was there, what time they got there, when they were leaving, maybe even look over their shoulder and see what they're up to. Not that any of those are best practices when it comes to people management. However, in these hybrid work models, it's really not possible for managers to be doing that. Instead, managers need to focus a lot more on managing for the employee's outcomes as opposing to managing for their inputs. Proximity bias is another key component of the performance management systems as people are working dispersed. Research supports that 55% of in-person employees are receiving feedback multiple times a week compared to 42% of fully remote peers. Additionally, pre-COVID research indicated that remote employees' promotion rates were reduced by as much as 50%. This is especially important when you think about the relation to different demographic preferences regarding flexible work. Specifically, according to a 2022 study, white employees were much likely to be returning to the office earlier than the people of color by a margin as much as 17 percentage points. Female employees are also one and a half times more likely than their male counterparts to prioritize flexibility, specifically as it results relates to staying at their current company. Leaders in HR need to ensure that there's no proximity bias at play when evaluating talent. Lastly, communication. So it's really important through these flexible working models that there is a clear line of sight of how employees contribute to the overall business goals and that managers are setting really clear expectations for how their team members are going to be evaluated. Moving into the moments that matter, I'm sure we've all heard this terminology before, but what exactly does it mean? So first of all, it's really important to note that the moments that matter are different for everybody. Some people might think a moment that matter is a big life event, such as a wedding, a birthday, maybe a specific holiday, where other people think the moments that matter are maybe everyday activities, such as picking their kids up from the school bus. Regardless of what the moments that matter are for employees, managers really need to be in tune to be sure that they understand the moments that matter for the individuals. Further, when it comes to moments that matter, organizations need to be cultivating weak ties that are currently being lost. Weak ties are defined as colleagues that you don't work directly with, but you might still have a workplace relationship with. Employees are currently interacting once a week or less with their week ties compared to several times a week before the pandemic. Organizations need to be mindful to help employees maintain these week ties. And we've established a couple of suggestions through our interviews and our research of how to help with that. So the first being to have some level of standardization of the in-office days. Some companies we spoke with were doing this at an organization level. Other companies were doing it based on the team's perspective. Other companies had a hybrid approach. Whatever the mix is, just so that the employees are coming in and they're able to collaborate and work among their peers. And this isn't to say there needs to be a minimum of in-office days a week for our fully flexible companies that we spoke with, but just so that there is some level of standardization so people can come together for those events. Moving on to the fostering employee connection, managers can do this in really simple ways, such as coffee hours or regular huddles, or potentially even just establishing a time and a place for everyone to get together to eat their lunch. And lastly, strategically scheduling meetings to minimize the virtual meetings on in-person days so that there's the maximum amount of time for collaboration. One simple suggestion would be leaders potentially holding virtual one-on-ones on days that they're at home and in-person one-on-ones on the days that they're in office, or potentially for consistency, maybe leaders will hold all of their one-on-ones remote so that everyone gets the same treatment. Regardless of what the strategy is, Team members and leaders both just need to be really strategic when they're scheduling meetings to maximize that in-office time. And with that, we'll shift to Joyce for the future of flexible work. So maybe Joyce, I'll I'll cut in real quick because we have a few questions that have come in. So maybe we'll take a few of those and I know we're getting here in the home stretch. So if others have uh, other questions, please do put them uh, into the Q&A or into the chat and We'll take them shortly in the Q&A session. So the first question I can actually answer, which was a uh, great presentation, lots of useful information will be made available afterwards. Uh, and yes, so we will be sending out a copy of the slides as well as a copy of the recording uh, so that you'll have access to those afterwards and certainly encourage you to share with others within your organizations uh, who may be interested. So a couple other questions. Um, you know, one is you talked about different kind of engagement activities, you know, in-person events, other things that companies can do to really try to 
create engagement, uh, particularly in these kind of hybrid models. Um, did you see anything particularly innovative or interesting that companies are doing around uh, engagement? Yeah, so one thing that I think we saw that we both thought were really interesting is so most companies, I think the easy thing might be to have coffee hours or something like that. Um, however, one company did mention that they had a Essentially, it sounded like a paint by numbers type canvas where employees could go and contribute to a painting. And one of the reasons why they really liked this is because employees were able to contribute to something. They felt like they were able to come together with their peers, but maybe for more introverted employees or employees that are less, less um, comfortable with being in these high pressure social settings, they were able to more casually do it and contribute to something that they really felt was valuable and helped to bring people together. That's great. So another question, um, any insights uh, about companies that are allowing flexible work arrangements, but are, are still requiring employees to be local to their offices? I think we saw one of the big challenges early in the pandemic was that when employees went remote and maybe thought they were going to be staying remote full time, people moved here, there and everywhere. And then companies were trying to bring people back and that created a lot of challenges. So even in those cases where companies are maybe offering full-time remote work, uh, is there an expectation that employees have to stay proximal to an office so they can be on site if and when needed? Did you hear any uh, discussion of that in your interviews? Yeah, I think there were, um, Allison, feel free to chime in after. Um, I think there were some companies that had like a primary location for those uh, working remotely, but generally, again, for like tax implications and for legal reasons, um, they they did require employees to to be local and to at least be close to an office hub um, for, for those reasons. Great. So uh, another question, I think this goes to your discussion around the you know, practice that you heard that you found interesting around, you know, having inclusive meetings, either all in person or all uh, remote. And I think the question is, you know, if you have these inclusive meetings, I'm guessing they're referring to when we allow them to be all remote, is that actually going to de-incentivize people going into the office? You know, why do I need to go in the office if I know these meetings are going to be held all remotely? So did you hear any examples of where companies have had to, to balance that or be cautious of maybe that risk? Uh, so unfortunately, no, I didn't hear anything about that. I do think it's an interesting point that potentially could happen. Um, you know, I'm kind of assuming from based on my conversation, but it seemed like there would be a balance of those meetings. So not every single meeting would be a virtual meeting um, if possible. So there would still be opportunities for people to come in and collaborate. And then I think potentially further, like having some of those other events, um, whether it's just like the lunches or bringing people together for other smaller moments might also help to still bring people together, even if there would be virtual meetings. Yeah. And I, I'll just add like, and I think generally people did, uh, you know, they had to drag some of their employees back into the office and then they realized once they were in the office, the benefits of that. So yes, uh, I, I wouldn't say that they were like disincentivized, but they weren't aware of how, you know, uh, valuable it would be to be in person and interacting with colleagues again. Yeah, I think those are good points. And I imagine the mix, we'd want to think about what's the nature of the meeting, how important is it for people to really have those in-person conversations, or is this something we can do effectively remotely? So I think kind of aligning the, the mode with the purpose of the meeting uh, is really important there. Maybe one more, there's a number of questions here and we can pick up a few more of these uh, during the Q&A session uh, shortly, but one more we can maybe take now is, um, Good question in terms of how did you define culture for the purposes of this study? Uh, an interesting question because I think culture is often a kind of broad, uh, somewhat vague term that people define somewhat differently. So did you have kind of a overarching kind of definition or did you hear maybe differences in how companies kind of think about and define uh, culture in their own uh, settings? Uh, yeah, so... I think initially we thought we should ask, you know, every company how they define culture. But um, generally what we saw was uh, we define culture as a mixture of driving performance, but also adhering to cultural values. And again, that's going to look very different in each company. So that's what we defined it as. And that's what we assumed our um, 
our uh, participants to find it as. Great. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and again, encourage uh, all of our attendees continue to, to share your questions and uh, we'll pick the rest of them up in a few minutes when we get to the Q&A session. All right, so coming to a close, yeah, we're optimistic about the future of uh, Flex Work, and it's clear, as Bla uh, Brad mentioned, um, that this doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. And um, so as we conducted the interviews and looked at the external research, it was clear that the question had turned to what is being impacted in the organizational culture by these Flex Work models to now, you know, how do companies maintain and craft a distinctive organizational culture that transcends distance, that transcends time zones and, um, and space that's exacerbated by these flexible work models. And so we made notes of two areas. And so the first area is an employee awareness and messaging. So we know that change fatigue is real. Uh, and we heard this echoed as a major concern for our cars, from our cars members. And this is also further supported by external research. Employees have grown accustomed to, you know, these autonomous and flexible work, work arrangements, and now they have to work on site, but we're also telling them you can come for some of the time, but then we're also telling them actually you have to come on Mondays and Fridays or Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and then you're, we're telling them there's restrictions on where they can work. So rightfully so, employees are skeptical and they're wondering, you know, when is my company uh, going to change this policy and when are they going to issue a full return to office? So companies just really need to be aware of this and need to work to minimize change in policies and messaging. And through our survey, we know that 84% of respondents indicated their employees were moderately or extremely aware of their flex work models. So here we want to emphasize that, you know, if you're going to change your flex models, it's important to keep employees in the loop and ensure that they have a line of sight to their work and that employers uh, you know, need to communicate why specific role warrants an in-person model versus flexibility in others. Employees also need to understand the benefits of going back to the office, as Allison mentioned, but also be informed of any negative or potential negative impacts on internal mobility or career growth as a result of being hybrid or remote. Lastly, companies need to be mindful about discussing these flex arrangements and tailoring it, tailoring the communication to different employee groups. So messaging needs to be inclusive and avoid tone deaf approaches and company-wide communications. Ultimately, uh, we believe that HR leaders should ensure change fatigue strategies are an inherent part of change management plans. So now uh, the second trend we observed from our research was the need to keep a pulse on geographic differences in norms and expectations. So from our research, a city's density, the size of people's homes, and cultural norms are among some of the factors that affect hybrid work patterns. So in the US alone, there are regional differences that are heavily influenced by things like access to public transit. Uh, so turning to the other side of the pond in the UK, there's a legislation known as the Flexible Working Act, and that empowers employees with the right to request flexible work without needing a business justification. And this law really reflects a significant shift in work culture, and companies should be proactive in assessing their policies to align with that. And internationally, as we see on the map, we see a very diverse adoption rate uh, to flex work. So countries like US and Australia and parts of Europe have a bit more remote days per month uh, than countries like those in South America and those in APAC that average about two days a month. And this leads us to the question that was brought up by our CARS members, which is the second part of this uh, slide, which is, you know, what do we now do with this office space? And post pandemic, uh, we know that there was a 30% reduction in traditional office attendance compared to pre pandemic times. Um, and this trend really presses employ employers, especially those bound by these long-term leases to really rethink space utilization. And the debate between hot desking and personal desking and workplace redesign and some of the location drivers that drive employees to the office versus home, these conversations are now more relevant than ever. And this shift really necessitates a more collaborative, collaborative approach cross-functionally, which involves HR facilities and operational teams. And I'll now pass it on to Allison for our key takeaways. Oh, 
Oh, you're on mute. So sorry. <laughs> As we close, we do want to leave you with a few key takeaways. The first is that everyone is building the plane while flying it. So companies really need to be engaging their employees and willing to adjust when needed while keeping in mind that change fatigue that Joyce mentioned. Next, organizations need to remember that they're balancing the business need with the individual, keeping in mind that every individual is different, and also individuals are going to be benchmarking to the external market through their network or through the news outlets of what's being reported. So if it was going to be part of your EVP, really keeping in mind that external market. Additionally, there is a potential for adverse impacts to employees where they are working, so HR should be ensuring that there's no proximity bias occurring when it comes to promotion or other opportunities. As these models have evolved, the manager's role has changed and more has potentially been shifted to their plate, so organizations need to be mindful of the managers and how the managers are feeling through these changes. As we mentioned, legislation has started to come through internationally. Potentially, there will be some coming in the United States. So legal teams and HR teams need to be mindful of this to ensure that as these legislation updates are occurring, policies are also being updated. And finally, there is ongoing research on the impact of these working models in regards to productivity and other implications. So organizations keep an eye out for that and feel free to adjust these models as needed. We really hope our presentation today provided you with some interesting insights on the impacts of these cultural, cultural impacts that organizations are seeing with these working models. And with that, we'll open it up for the rest of the questions. Great. Thanks, Allison. Joyce, nice job. Certainly a ton of valuable insights in there for all of our companies that are navigating this uh, rapidly evolving space. So we have a couple other questions that have come in. Again, encourage uh, anyone else who has a question that they'd like addressed before we close today, please uh, do submit it. Uh, so the first question deals with the um, compressed work weeks that you referenced earlier. Seems to be a fairly uh, popular uh, approach to flex work across at least some companies. The question is, you know, what was the reasoning behind these compressed work weeks and, you know, any specific impacts on uh, the way of working and the culture in those organizations or maybe leaning on those more than, let's say, location flexibility? Yeah, I can start. So um, the compressed work weeks that we saw, um, some of those were in manufacturing and traditional roles that needed to be on site. So um, my perception was it was a way to give them flexibility without having to uh, or without modifying how much time they're working in the office or the outcomes of their work. So um, one other thing that we did see is a couple of companies use compressed work weeks as a means of accommodations for personal circumstances, but it was not the normal among knowledge workers, um, at least in any of the interviews that we had. Great. So a question here from Brian that I have my own thoughts on, but I would love to hear yours first. Um, you know, we're seeing a number of companies pulling back on remote work, um, you know, requiring more days in the office or laying off employees who refuse to move back uh, to hub locations. Uh, any thoughts or any insights from your interviews in terms of maybe what's driving a little bit of this kind of regression back to older ways of more traditional ways of working, maybe I'll say, in, in some organizations. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so I think generally um, there, we didn't see that with the companies that we interviewed. Um, there wasn't really any, you know, they weren't, people weren't reprimanded or fired for, or I mean, they didn't explicitly say it, but um, I think the more interesting part uh, that we, we talked to these companies about was the like spillover effects of people who do choose to be remote um, for roles that were traditionally not uh, remote. So things like, again, career growth opportunities, or maybe um, the, like the knowledge sharing aspect and some of the, uh, yeah, like more informal, like water cooler moments that help, you know, bridge communication and also help you work more effectively, like on a project. Um, I think those are things that might uh, perhaps like impact um, your performance and could have a, could lead you to being fired. But generally we didn't really discuss that or that was never really an issue that was brought up by the CARS members. Great. 
Yeah, I was going to add, I mean, I think my sense is that there was always companies that were resistant from the beginning, but felt like they their hand was forced because others in their industry were doing it. Uh, we had the great resignation, all these talent scarcity. Um, so I think for many, or I shouldn't say many, for some, I think they were waiting for the opportunity to get back to where they maybe wanted to be when the labor market cooled off or when some of their uh, peers, uh, you know, made similar changes. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how this evolves over time uh, and whether those companies shift yet again or whether um, we just kind of see a, a segmentation across different types of companies here. I think this is kind of somewhat related question, but um, any insights on where employees get fired because they refuse going to office? And I think, Joyce, you alluded to it. I mean, some of the working groups that I've done with our companies suggest even when companies are monitoring it, there's typically not really punitive measures in place uh, to the degree of firing. Uh, but could you maybe, it sounds like you experienced the same thing in your interviews. Yeah, and I think generally, um, you know, some companies that were mandating some more like strict, like four days a week back to the office um, saw a natural turnover. So they just kind of like left the company as a result of the enforcement of these policies. Um, and, and they were, you know, generally happy with that because again, they were able to bring in employees who were aware of these policies and were more in tune with, um, yeah, the hybrid or more in-person arrangements. Yeah. But it also seems like, Allison, your point about the accountability earlier, I mean, you alluded to the fact that some companies seem to be building time in the office into some of their performance evaluation metrics. So although they might not be firing, they might be rewarding differentially or uh, across employees based on whether they're adhering to in-person ex expectations. Great, so um, let's see, a uh, question from Kim. Uh, did you hear of any companies that have a policy relating to remote work that mandated the employee be on video? Um, or being at your designated remote location unless there was uh, prior prior approvals. Um, what type of things did you see companies requiring in, in this regard? I can start. I don't think we heard any companies that were requiring employees to be on video. We did talk with a lot of companies. It was a theme that people being on video felt more authentic and people were more collaborative and willing to um, talk. And some external research I saw, um, one of the suggestions was actually for employees to really um, over animate themselves. So like you wouldn't probably wave goodbye to people in an in-person meeting, but maybe waving goodbye on a virtual meeting might help to create more personal connections and make it seem more personal. Um, but to answer your question, I didn't see any companies that were fully requiring people to be on video. I don't know, Joyce, if you have a, anything to add. Yeah, I think it's an interesting issue because there's actually just a, a paper published recently in one of our journals that suggests the requirement to be on video has uh, different implications across um, men and women, where it's much more kind of creates much more emotional labor among women because there's a higher uh, you know, expectation to present themselves in a certain way or have a certain uh, image of an office, et cetera, that maybe men don't feel. So it creates more kind of stress and negative well-being outcomes among women. So I think to your point, companies might want to be a little bit cautious about mandating a, a singular approach across uh, all employees there. Uh, another question that came in, I think it's kind of getting at this idea of, um, you know, it seems like generally employees like flexibility. It seems like the company representatives you talk to generally see the benefits of flexibility for their orgs. Um, but we often know there's at least pockets, if not uh, more of leaders who aren't really on board with flexibility because they believe that they need to see their employees, keep tabs on them. Um, did you hear any of that in your interviews and you know, how are companies really trying to get the leaders on board with when maybe they're resistant uh, to all of this? 
Yeah, Joyce kind of alluded to it earlier. What I think we saw more than the resistance is that the resistance happened at first when we were first asking people return to office. And then as people started to return, it was a consistent theme over companies that people were really enjoying coming back to the office. They enjoyed being able to collaborate with their peers. And so it almost kind of snowballed once people started to come in and got over that initial hurdle of readjusting to the in-office. Um, it wasn't as much a um, point of tension that we saw, I don't think. Yeah, and I think this also touches on the manager skills and the importance of managers of being aware of these individual preferences um, and, you know, the the demands of home and, and the individual needs of the, of the employees and the team members. And so even though autonomy, and I think that's why, sorry, companies gave so much autonomy to the managers. It's because, you know, there wasn't a one size fits all policy that applies to every employee, but that, um, you know, managers really need to be more empathetic and really understand that, especially post pandemic, um, each employee is really going to need uh, different accommodations depending on their needs and their and their life situation. So one follow up I have, and I had this thought as you were presenting, you talked about some companies have this automatic policy that if employees have to be on site, then their manager automatically has to be on site. I'm wondering, do you have, did you see any reverse policies where if employees could be hybrid or remote? There was also an expectation that managers had to be hybrid or remote. I mean, there is research out there that suggests that when employees and their managers are both in the same work models, they work a lot better because I think of the empathy issue that you raised. Um, but I'm curious if you saw any kind of that in the reverse kind of policy sense. Yeah, I didn't see any in the external uh, research. Austin, I'm not sure if you did. No, but what we did see was that I think the expectation was consistently whatever employees were doing would be what the managers were doing with a few exceptions. I think we heard from a couple of companies maybe that had certain levels of leadership that were being asked to come in. But um, outside of that, I would say that was maybe like one or two companies that vast majority were um, wanting the managers and team members to be doing the same thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe one last question for you. I mean, you spent all semester researching this topic. Again, lots of great insights, um, but there's only so much you can do in, in one semester. And probably as you went along, you heard things that sparked some new questions. You know, if you could kind of do round two of this, what, what were some of your maybe unanswered questions that you'd really like to see uh, kind of dig into a bit? Yeah, um, I'll start, Allison. Uh, so I think the area of um, understanding how flex work policies will affect um, those traditionally on-site, uh, you know, factory level or frontline work, um, I think is super interesting. So I think that's the second area, like that would be the next stage to explore. And you know, there are interesting, you know, um, startups like uh, Gig and Take who are doing that work and are like providing the tech infrastructure to help kind of build like a, a gig like type of app for frontline workers. So it'll be interesting to see how that space develops. Yeah, I would say the middle level managers would be my area that I would probably want to deep dive a bit more. Um, as we talked, the manager's role did change. And I think the skills for managers have really changed and what we're putting on managers is maybe greater now than ever before. So how do the managers feel and how are they adjusting to these flex models? And is there further support that organizations can provide to them to ensure their success through these new working models? Great. So maybe one last question that came in, I'll ask you to kind of look in your crystal ball based on what you heard here. But, uh, Question is, you know, where will where do you think remote work will be in five years? Um, do you think we'll see kind of a reversion back to closer where we were pre-pandemic? Uh, do you think this, you know, kind of where we've leveled out with hybrid being the dominant model, at least among those that have the flexibility to work some at home, do you think that will remain kind of the dominant model going forward? Um, just would love your your guesses in, in that regard. I love this question. <laughs> um, I personally would say um, potentially more days a week in office might be the norm, but I do think hybrid is going to stay. Um, in our research, we found significant expectations from employees that hybrid work is going to stay. As I mentioned earlier, generationally across generations, people really value flexible um, work models. So I do think that to some level, it's going to be the new normal. And I 
I don't think we'll go fully five days a week back in person consistently. Maybe it'll continue to move a little bit in that direction in the next five years, but overall, I definitely think it would be hybrid work. Yeah, uh, I, I'll have like a, I have a slightly different answer. So I think that it, it will be still like hybrid, but more on the flexible side. Um, but again, uh, you know, these policies and these arrangements will only be as good as like the laws and the legal landscape um, that's involved. So um, I think one of the CARS members also mentioned that, you know, the, the laws um, are really behind on like what employees need, but we're seeing, you know, countries like Australia and like the UK and perhaps Canada who are um, incorporating more fair work laws to help uh, really accommodate those employee groups who who need more flexible work and so i think we'll see a trend toward that hopefully yeah no oh, great great thoughts so uh with that i'd like to thank uh everyone for joining us today uh again we'll be sharing out a copy of the the presentation and the recording I encourage you to share it uh with anyone in your networks that might be interested really want to thank allison and joyce for all their work this semester it was great working with both of you tons of great insights on this important topic uh, and so thank you again thank you everyone take care